All right, so the topic of uh, low charge. One of my least favorite ones to talk about because it is the thing that a lot of techs do, you know, add a little Freon, go to the customer's house. The number one thing that they suggest that the system needs is, you know, just add a little Freon. Um, we got, you know, Emily's made some pretty good memes about that. And so I always am kind of careful to even talk about it because I don't want you to have excuses to just add refrigerant to the system. But I do want to talk about kind of what's going on because I think it might make it a little more clear and then talk about what are the actual signs or actual symptoms for troubleshooting low charge. talk about charge in the first place. So I do need to, I do need to change my uh, illustration. So we're going to, we're going to start with the compressor on top. This is the Jim Bergman way. So we go to compressor and then we go to condenser over on this side here because the condenser is fed in the top. And then as it goes, goes down, then it comes out as a liquid. And then we go to our metering device. I always like to just, you know, we always do this basic stuff again because it helps us. And then in our evaporator coil, we feed our evaporator coil into the bottom, and then it comes out of vapor, and then it goes back to our compressor on the suction line. So compressor, pressure increaser, condenser's heat rejector, which turns into condensing, changes it from a vapor to a liquid, goes in all vapor, desuperheats, then it uh, begins condensing through most of the condenser, then at the end it has this kind of liquid seal down at the bottom. So liquid stacks from the bottom up, then it goes to our metering device, fully liquid. Metering device is our pressure dropper, generally a TXV or electronic expansion valve nowadays. Comes out of that as a flash gas, feeds our evaporator coil, fills it mostly with boiling refrigerant, which is where most of that work is done. That's the latent heat of vaporization, that change from liquid to vapor. And then at the very end, it's fully vapor, which is what we call superheat, and that goes back to the compressor. So a couple things that we've talked about separately that I just want to make sure that we're anchoring here and remembering. When we're looking at subcooling, subcooling is telling us how full in the condenser, how full the condenser is of liquid. Some of you have pointed out that subcooling as a number doesn't tell us that, and that of course is true, but a higher subcooling number on the same system means that there is more liquid stacking in the condenser. A lower subcooling number means there's less liquid stacking in the condenser. We need to make sure that we feed our metering device with liquid, so we need to have a high enough subcooling number that, we're, that we ensure that even with the pressure drops in the liquid line before it makes it to our metering device that we have a full line of liquid entering our metering device. Okay, So higher subcool means more liquid stacking in the condenser, which we need to have a high enough number that it ensures that we feed our metering device, but we don't want higher subcooling than we need unless we're doing mechanical subcooling, which is a totally different subject because higher subcooling than we need means that we're taking up more of our condenser space with liquid, which means that our head pressure is going to be driven up. Therefore, our compression ratio is going to be driven up, it means our compressor is not going to move as much refrigerant, and that results in lower capacity. So we don't want to stack more liquid in the condenser than we need to, but we want to make sure that we have enough liquid to provide a full line of liquid to our metering device. Evaporator coil, higher superheat, uh, or should say, let's start with lower superheat. Lower, the lower the superheat, the more refrigerant is filling the evaporator coil with boiling refrigerant. The higher the superheat, the sooner in the coil it's boiling off. So we want sufficient superheat to ensure that we don't get liquid back to our compressor. We want only vapor back to the compressor. So we want to make sure that we have sufficient superheat for that. At the compressor, that number is generally around 20 for most air conditioning systems. Um, that's what Copeland kind of publishes as their standard. They like to see 20 degrees of superheat. But really anything at the compressor between 10 and 20 is going to be what we would typically expect. Leaving the evaporator coil, uh, it's generally going to be, you know, anywhere from 6 at the lowest um, to about 14 uh, at the highest, leaving our evaporator coil. And so we're going to pick up a little bit of heat in the suction line before it goes back to the compressor. Those are some basic things that we look at. And so we're, in, in terms of fullness of our condenser, and again, a lot of people, a lot of you will dispute that because again, this is this conflict between a quantitative, which is a number, which subcooling is, it's a quantitative measurement versus qualitative. And when I say fullness, fullness is a qualitative measurement. How full is it with liquid? But I'm saying, you know, same system under similar conditions, um, if it's more full, that's going to be a higher subcool. So more full equals higher 
subcool. And in terms of our evaporator coil fullness, again, that's a qualitative measurement, but that's going to be a lower superheat. So that's one of the factors that we're looking at in terms of charge. Do we need more charge? Well, with modern systems, because we typically have, rather than having fixed metering devices, we have actually actively controlled metering devices, electronic expansion valves, and TXVs, and their job is to help control the superheat. So our primary job in terms of setting the charge is to make sure that we have a full line of liquid feeding the metering device. Now, those of you who work in refrigeration, I was gonna kinda put an homage out there. If you've got a receiver in the system, well, then we have a sight glass in our liquid line, uh, and the sight glass actually tells us whether we're full or not. You're not going to see as much subcool. So if you have a receiver, you're not really counting on subcool as a number. You're usually looking at a clear sight glass, meaning you're, you're visually looking to see, do I have a full line of liquid entering my metering device? But that really is the point. That's why we're doing this. We're, we're measuring subcool to make sure that we've got enough liquid and that it's going to make up for the fact that we've got this liquid line because when we're taking our measurements, when we're checking your high side pressure and your low side pressure on a typical air conditioner, you're connecting your high side to the liquid line at the condenser and you're connecting your low side to the suction line at the compressor. So you've got these lines in between. We don't necessarily know what the pressures are at the inside because the inside unit is this stuff right here, our metering device and our evaporator coil. So we'll call that our air handler or coil. So whether it's a gas furnace and you've got a case coil or an uncased coil, or whether it's a fan coil or air handler, these two are inside and we've got our line set, which is our suction and liquid line. So we'll, we'll write that here. This is our liquid line and this is our suction line. This makes up our line set, at least in cooling mode, right? Or we call this, if this is a heat pump, we would call this the vapor line. So because we have this differences in measurement, we're measuring out here versus in here, we got to make sure that we've got enough. We've got the right number of superheat coming out and we've got the or the right number of superheat going back in, and we got the right number of subcooling coming out. And subcooling is the first thing that we look at. So when we're checking for charge, before we even get to that phase though, I wanna make sure that we're doing our visual inspection. So look for the obvious, right? Now, we'll point, many people will point out, and rightly so, that even if you have airflow problems, you're still gonna be able to rely on subcool. So subcool is a pretty reliable number, but I still, especially for junior techs, I want you doing a thorough visual inspection first. Air filter, walk the house, make sure there's nothing dumb going on. They don't have a couch pushed up against the return. You know, we see this a lot in rental houses where people will pull down a non-filter grill return and they'll jam a filter up in it. So, you know, take your flashlight, look up into, into those uh, return air grills to make sure nothing's jammed in them. Just obvious stuff like that. Look at your evaporator coil, take a mirror, or take your, uh, your cell phone if you want and look underneath to make sure that you don't have a completely plugged evaporator coil. Um, take a look at your blower wheel and make sure it's not all gummed up. Make sure that your settings are proper on your air handler. So that make sure they put the Y wire on that Y slash Y2 instead of Y1. So it's ramping up to high speed. Again, depending on the type of equipment you work on, these things might vary. But you want to confirm these obvious things related to indoor airflow. And then go outside, take a look at your condenser. Is, it, is the thing just gummed up? Is it completely dirty? Those are things you want to address before you start trying to dial in charge. But regardless, we can rely pretty heavily on looking at our subcool number. If our subcool is zero, and we know it's zero because we know that our, our gauges are working, our probes, make sure you're zeroing stuff out, all that kind of thing first. You have to have reliable tools before you can measure this stuff. Make sure that they're depressing the straighters on the equipment. You see this so often where people are getting weird readings, and the reason is, is because their actual straighter on their device isn't depressing uh, the, the ports. So we can rely heavily on this subcool number. And so I would say for modern systems, subcool is our first and foremost indicator. Next in line is we would call our suction pressure or our suction saturation. And this is where that kind of rule of thumb comes in. That is a very reliable rule of thumb for our industry. And that is that our evaporator TD, and don't, don't confuse evaporator TD with delta T, not the same thing. We take our return temperature, and so let's say we have a return temperature of 80 degrees because we're assuming this unit's not working very well, right? We subtract 35 degrees from that, and so if we take 35 degrees off of that, then that indicates what our um, expected suction saturation temperature would be. So that leaves us with 45 degrees, right? 
So if we use something like the refrigerant slider app here, so if you use something like the Ref Tools refrigerant slider app from Dan Foss, which is kind of my favorite. If you guys don't have this on your on your phone, then I would suggest you do that. We got this on 410A, and you can see that the uh, at 45 degrees, that's an 130 degree suction saturation. So this 45 degree represents our evaporator temperature. Return temperature, minus 35. This is what we would call our evaporator temperature, and that relates to a 130.1, we'll just say 130 PSIG suction. Make sure that when you're using the app that you're not using uh, absolute pressure, otherwise that's going to throw it off. So if you, you see absolute pressure is 144, that's that 14.7 that we add on for atmospheric. So it's 130 PSIG, 130 pounds per square inch gauge pressure on our suction side equals a 45 degree evaporator temperature. This is what we're gonna to expect to see. Now the problem here, and this is one of the biggest things that people do wrong when they start adding charge to a system, is that this could easily be too low. So this is what we would expect it to be, let's, but let's say that instead we've got a 30 degree. So this is what we would call a DTD, a design temperature difference, meaning we would expect, based on the design, that if the return is 80, minus 35, that we'd be running this pressure, but let's say we're running something different, we're running 30 degrees. And so if we just want to do this just for the sake of it, we'll take our refrigerant slider app again. And now that's 97 PSIG. So let's say we're running 97 PSIG suction. We walk up to this system. The typical knee-jerk reaction is going to be to say, hey, this is too low. My design temperature difference is 45. My actual is 30. We need to add refrigerant to it. But what we have to establish first is, is, is this caused by an airflow problem? And that's where we go through and we check a couple things first. We check that subcool. If our subcool is where it's supposed to be, don't add refrigerant. If our subcool is zero, okay, add refrigerant. At that point, if you've got a zero subcool and you've got this, you can go ahead and add. Now, I do want you checking your superheat as well, though. If your system is operating with, and again, the TXV controls the superheat, but if your system is operating within the expected superheat range, that would be, like I said, typical, you know, 14 degrees, 10 to 14 degrees inside, um, 10 to 20 degrees outside. Um, if it's within that range, I still want you to pause because we need to make sure, because again, at 30 degrees, we could actually start to get a little ice on that evaporator coil. More likely that it would get down into the 20s before we start to build ice but I need you to do that visual inspection. Make sure there is zero ice on your evaporator coil. Make sure there are zero obvious airflow problems before you start adding charge. Don't just look at this low suction pressure. You can also look at your condensing temperature over ambient number. Now, the CTOA varies more uh, depending on the efficiency of the system, but your kind of modern CTOA that we would expect is you know, 15 to 20 degrees over that um, outdoor temperature. So whereas EVAP TD, 35 degrees is pretty typical. I mean, you, you will see some systems, especially in humid environments with large evaporator coils where you may get down as low as 30 degrees here rather than 35. Um, and that, all that would do is just actually ri raise your expected evaporator temperature, which would mean we were even further off with what we have here. But let's look at CTOA quickly. And again, I know this is drinking from a fire hose. I know the number one complaint I'm gonna get from you in the class and in the videos that I'm talking too fast. But what I'm trying to get you to do is slow down before you start adding refrigerant to the system. We've already talked about when you do add refrigerant to the system, use a scale um, to, so that you're not just adding refrigerant unnecessarily. But I want you to be really clear so that you can know for a fact when a system does need refrigerant. So let's look at CTOA. CTOA is condensing temperature over ambient. And simply what that means is, is that if you take the outdoor temperature, let's say it's 90 degrees, your kind of typical adder for modern high efficiency equipment is going to be 15 degrees. So this is what we would call our a design CTOA, so DCTOA. This is what we would expect. That would be 105 degrees condensing temperature, which is you know how we get condensing temperature. Again, if you go to your refrigerant slider app here, 105 degrees is 340.8 PSIG. So we'll just say 341, 341 PSIG. That's what we expect, right? And so if you have a system that's in this range and you have subcool, meaning five, 10 degrees of subcool, then you're, you're really not low on charge. Adding more charge isn't gonna solve this problem. 
Now, if you walk up to it and you're running 250 PSIG or something like that, and again, that, that wouldn't even be realistic. It would be, you would get closer to your outdoor temperature. So let's just say it's 91 degrees. So like 278. That would equal a one degree CTOA, condensing temperature over ambient. Now that would be an indication of a low charge when coupled with a low or zero subcooling number and a low um, evaporator temperature. Evaporator temperature is lower than what you would expect. And again, the language that I use might be confusing, but when I am measuring high side pressure, I'm converting that in my head to condensing temperature. So this 105 degrees, because that works better with that sort of expected rule of thumb that we call our design condensing temperature over ambient. Same thing with the evaporator temperature. 75 degrees inside, the easiest thing to remember here is if it's 75 degrees inside, I expect about a 40 degree evaporator temperature. If it's 90 degrees outside, I expect about 105 degree condensing temperature. And the reason why those are the ones I remember is because in Florida, those are going to be pretty common in the summer when I'm testing equipment. As this outdoor temperature number goes down, so this is our outdoor temperature, as this goes down, then our condensing temperature is also going to go down proportionally with it. Point being that you can't just say, hey, the pressures seem low, so I'm going to add some Freon to it. That's like the worst version of adding refrigerant. We add refrigerant when we see, again, modern system, when we see that we have a low or zero subcooling number, we see that we have a low evaporator temperature, meaning a colder evaporator temperature than we, we would expect, we're going to see a higher superheat than we would expect. Again, that tells us that our evaporator coil is less full. And we're going to see a lower condensing temperature than we would expect. Those are our indications. When we measure our return temperature and our supply temperature, that's when you're going to start to see your delta T drop as well. Now, that's not a reliable one. It's not the one I want you to rely on mostly, but it is kind of a quick and dirty um, estimation. It varies with humidity and airflow and a lot of things, which is why I don't love it. But what you're going to see is a low condensing temperature, again, when you're low on charge, a low evaporator temperature, key indicator, low subcool, lower subcool than expected, higher superheat, because again, lower subcool means less full, higher superheat means less full. And when you're low on refrigerant, that's what you expect. An evaporator coil that's less full, a condenser that's less full, a liquid line pressure, which equals a condensing temperature that's lower a evaporator pressure that equals a lower evaporator temperature that's lower than expected, that tells us it's time to add refrigerant. After you've done a full visual inspection, and even then, don't add refrigerant until the system's been running a little bit, unless it's very, very low, and you can see that, uh, obviously, in your pressures. Make sure that you're depressing those Schrader cores that are getting pushed in by your probes, or your hoses, or your stubs, or whatever you're using. I see a lot of cases, people see crazy pressures literally because they have their hose backwards, where the side that doesn't have a core depressor is being connected. Um, so visual inspection, obvious things, use a scale, make sure that you're not, you know, that you're paying attention to what the factory charge is and what your line length is generally, so that you can kind of estimate how much refrigerant should be in it so that when you're adding refrigerant and things aren't changing the way you would expect, you stop and you look at airflow or you look at re refrigerant restrictions. If you have things like obvious line dryers, that sort of thing in the system, go ahead and take a temperature difference across that liquid line dryer. Make sure that the line dryer isn't restricted. Look for obvious issues, kinked liquid lines, you know, things like that, uh, before you make that decision to go ahead and start adding charge to the system. So that's a lot, I know, but that's it. Consider all this stuff before you add refrigerant. I had somebody post a super like emo uh, comment on one of the videos saying that like this is way too hard and confusing and that he's just going to deliver pizzas. Uh, yeah, it's it, it isn't that bad actually once you practice it, but you can't just add refrigerant and see what happens. Um, for many reasons, first off, like it's not good for the equipment, it wastes time, but also refrigerant is really expensive now. So adding refrigerant that you don't need to add wastes a lot of money and it's gonna be hard to stay in business if you do that. So doing all your visual inspections, being really thorough before you say, okay, I know putting this refrigerant in the system is the right decision. That's the, that's the way to think about adding refrigerant to a system that has the symptoms of low charge. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, 
videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.